Alex Byrne, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much for having me. So you've just published a, a new book called Trouble with Gender. Um, uh, it's a very interesting book in itself. There's also an interesting backstory here where it was um, meant to be published by one of the premier uh, academic presses in the world, but there was a kind of rebellion a a a against it. Um, what, what, what happened in this process and what was so unusual about it? So I, be I became interested in the general topic of sex and gender a few years ago, and I'd written a few things for a, a popular audience about it on whether sex is socially constructed, uh, whether sex is binary. And um, a book was uh, brewing. I thought a, a general interest book was was needed on this on this topic, treating the issues from a, uh, a philosophical perspective. And so I shopped around various publishers. Of course, I knew the whole topic was was radioactive. It's kind of one of one of the third rails at the moment um, in the academy and outside. And I'd published a scholarly monograph, as we say, with Oxford University Press before on self-knowledge, and I had a great experience with them. And anyway, to cut a uh, long story short, eventually um, OUP gave me a contract, Oxford University Press, and they were very enthusiastic about the book, and they said they would promote it for a general audience. And then... Um, I think I yeah I started to write the book in 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 2021 with the with the OUP contract and then various things happened in the interim so one thing that happened was that there was a big fuss a protest over OUP's publication of another book on sex and gender by the philosophy by by the University of Melbourne philosopher Holly Lawford Smith uh this was called gender critical feminism and um, Oxford, to their great credit, faced down this protest quite well. But um, I think it, it's very likely that they were spooked by the whole episode. And after that, um, I had um, an invited chapter on pronouns, as in he, she, they, them, uh, cancelled by Oxford University Press, which was a extremely unusual, basically unheard of. You don't invite someone to write unpaid um, a chapter in a, uh, an Oxford University Press handbook and then um, refuse to publish the chapter without allowing the author to make any revisions. Anyway, that's exactly what happened. Uh, in, in my case, one of the editors of the handbook um, actually announced that they would not be publishing my chapter on on Twitter. So the whole the whole thing was just completely outrageous. So that happened, and uh, sh shortly, and then Holly had Holly Lawford Smith had run into some other problems with OUP when she was uh, working on her second book, um, again on on sex and gender called um, called Sex Matters. Um, my book um, was cancelled by OUP. Um, fairly soon after I submitted it in uh, 2022. And uh, as you know, what normally happens is that um, you get a contract uh, to write a book with, with an academic press, you submit a draft, you then get uh, reviews back from expert reviewers, you then make revisions, and the process maybe iterates a few times, and eventually the book is published. It's extremely rare for the book not to be published. Um, it's even rarer for the draft manuscript to be rejected um, without inviting any revisions uh, whatsoever. Uh, but that is what happened in And, and what, was uh, the in stated, what was the stated logic here? What is it that the, Oxford University Press the, said was wrong with a book? Or I, I, I presume they didn't say this violated uh, taboo of ours. They said somehow the work was no, shoddy right. or not up to standard. Well, they said that, um, and let me see if I can re remember the quote. There was just one line in the rejection email uh, to the effect that the book didn't treat the subject in a sufficiently serious and respectful way. That was it. So there were no examples given of um, this lack of respect or lack of seriousness. And the the claim about lack of seriousness was particularly annoying because uh, uh, as you you'll see if you 
you've looked at the book, you'll notice that there are a huge number of endnotes and um, a massive list of references. So the the, the idea that I didn't uh, treat the subject seriously is is a little ludicrous. Well, and ordinarily, um, what what happens in academic publishing, whether it's for articles or whether it's for books of university presses, is that there's uh, anonymous external reviewers. Um, and, you know, in the case where a work is turned down, which is very frequent in the case of academic uh, articles, less often if you already have a book yes, contract right. for a university press, that's um, right. you would usually get the report from those examiners, which uh, should contain uh, specific and clear uh, uh, reasoning as to what is uh, not up to standard about the work. And it sounds like uh, this was not included here. Well, I did get... Um... I did get some referee reports. Um, um, I can't remember how many. I think it was four. Uh, some, well, one in particular was extremely positive. Um, uh, at least one was quite negative. But the uh, the stated reason for rejecting the book had absolutely nothing to do with the content of any referee reports. I mean, they weren't referred to. Nothing was um, identified in the book as particularly problematic. There was no reference to any um, uh, specific, sp specific poor argument that I'd made or a specific error that I, that, I had, uh, that I had committed. And I think it was clear why OUP didn't try to say, um, didn't try to argue their way into rejecting the book because, of course, then I, I would have had an opportunity to say, oh, I, I don't agree for this reason or this is not very convincing or this referee is wrong and so on. But I wasn't, I wasn't given that opportunity. Um, I think it was clear that they just didn't want to publish the book. So <laughs> the easiest thing to, uh, to do would be just to make this blanket, vague condemnation of the book about not treating the subject with sufficient respect. I mean, what can you do when, when, when faced with that criticism? You can't like point to a chapter and say, well, there you go. You're, this criticism is, is wrong. It's very vague and, and subjective. And OUP gave no examples whatsoever, no specific examples whatsoever of instances where I'd been disrespectful or unserious. Well, thankfully, the book was picked up by Polity, um, and it is yes. now out in the United Kingdom and the United States. Um, let's delve into this subject, which uh, is an important one, but does deserve to be treated with seriousness. Um, uh, and it's one that I think has a lot of people uh, understandably confused. So why don't we start with a very basic uh, set of questions about what is biological sex and what is the notion of gender and how are those similar or different? Why is it that we need this additional category of gender in order to make sense of the world? Okay, so just to start with to start with biological sex, there's a chapter in the book called Clownfish and Chromosomes, which is all about biological sex. I mean, there's a huge amount of confusion on this topic, both in philosophy and gender studies, which I try to unravel in that chapter. And as far as the question, what is sex, goes, um, here I just lean on the absolutely standard textbook account of what the two sexes are. To, uh, in, a, in a nutshell... Uh, to be male is to have a, a body plan that is designed to produce small gametes, sex cells, sperm. And to be female is to have a body plan that's designed to produce large gametes or sex cells, i.e. eggs. So it has nothing... The, the, this distinction between male and female has, has nothing in particular to do with primary or secondary sex characteristics like having a penis or having a vagina or having uh, having breasts. Uh, it has nothing to do with having XX chromosomes over uh, versus XY chromosomes. Um, there are plenty of sexed uh, animals. Uh, of course, plants also um, uh, come in sexes that have no, no sex chromosomes at all. So in Instead, the, the relevance of sex chromosomes is simply 
in the case of mammals, uh, to be the, uh, the mechanism by which organisms come to be male and female in the first place. It's part of the sex, sex determination mechanism. Other animals have different sex determination mechanisms. I mean, some animals have temperature de uh, uh, dependent sex determination mechanisms, depending on the temperature, the ambient temperature when the eggs hatch, that's going to determine whether uh, the animal pops out as male or female. So that's, um, that's what the two sexes are. Uh, that is straightforward, even though um, if you read the philosophical or gender studies literature, s sex, according to that literature, is often portrayed as this sort of confusing melange of traits like chromosomes, hormones, genitalia, and so on. And sometimes people say, well, you know, which ones we pick to define the sexes depends on the context, perhaps also on our political aims. Further, some people have suggested uh, the biologist and gender studies theorist Anne Foster Sterling is an example that there may be more than two sexes. She once suggested that there are at least five. And just to add to the confusion, it's often said, again, Foster Sterling is a source for this, that a significant proportion of the population is intersex, neither male nor female. So being neither male nor female is supposedly as common as having red hair. Um, you know, close to close to two percent of the population. So anyway, all that, according to me, is just completely wrong. Like there's no <laughs> there's no truth to that whatsoever. Um, so, so okay, let's, so let's that's, help, yeah, help yeah, me help me yeah, puzzle through this yeah, for them. So, yeah, sure. Uh, in general, my philosophical commitments are such that um, we can't cut uh, nature by its joints, which is to say that how we classify things will always depend on uh, the kinds of purposes which the classification serves, um, and that insight I think is a limited one. It doesn't get. We sure. don't get nearly as much out of that as some radical deconstructionists, but it's an important one, right? So I don't think, for example, uh, this is a sort of silly example I often use of undergraduates. There's no correct concept of T. Um, you know, to an English speaker, a T may uh, contain some amount of TE, no caffeine, um, so it may be black tea or green tea, but it may also be chamomile tea or peppermint tea, even for those don't contain any tea in um, in the French conception of tea, it is uh, bound to that class of drinks, which uh, is an infusion which um, contains tea and caffeine. So for them, they would call a chamomile tea or peppermint tea a tisane, and they don't think yes. of that as part of the same category of drink. Now, I don't think there's a sort of objective way of determining what the better way is of using the term tea. One is more useful when you think about it being the afternoon, you've had a big lunch and you need a stimulant to wake up a little bit. The other is more useful when it's a cold winter day and you just want to offer your guests something to warm up, right? Um, uh, right. If we generally, um, or, or I guess what would you say, you may not share the general skepticism, uh, to somebody who is a little bit skeptical in general about uh, uh, sort of saying there's one and one only way of defining a term, um, because I might listen to what you were saying and say, all right, that's a very interesting distinction that um, there is this consistent uh, difference in which animals uh, produce small uh, sex cells and which animals produce large sex cells. And that certainly is one important distinction. But why is it that we should use that distinction as the basis of a difference between a bi being a biological male rather than a biological female, rather than the kind of characteristics that we would often think of in ordinary uh, contexts, including in some of the heated political debates right now, as being particularly important, which is things like, what are your primary uh, uh, sex character sure. ca ca characteristics? Sure. Do you have a penis or a vagina? Sure. Yeah, okay, the, that, uh, okay that's an excellent question. And you, yeah, you, you raised quite a number of different things there. So so one is the cutting nature at the joints idea. I, I think that goes back, that metaphor goes back to Plato, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, I don't think this is really central to your, to your point, but philosophers typically do think that there is such a thing, 
that some things cut nature at the joints and other things don't cut nature at the joints, or maybe this is a um, this is a comparative matter. So, for example, um, uh, we have a classification of um, sorry, we have the we have the category of gold, let's say, and we have the category of neon, which is another another element, and those are joint carving. Uh, categories in a way that um, either being a pen or a podcaster is not. It's true there are some things that are either pens or podcasters, right? I'm I'm talking to one of these things right now. Uh, you are either a pen or a podcaster in virtue of being a podcaster. Here is another thing, right, which um, is also either a pen or a podcaster. This is because it's a pen. Obviously, you and the pen don't have you don't have very much in common that's a kind of gerrymandered category that in the uh, as philosophers often think of it doesn't cut nature at its joints um okay so that that's that's the first point and then related to that um philosophers who are fond of the the joint carving will generally tend to look for science sorry look to science for categories that are joint carving and the fact that biology heavily traffics in the categories of male and female as a sign, they would say that those two categories are joint carving. But then you raise this other point. Well, you raise two other points. So um, one, one is about words and how to, how to define words. And of course, many words, including the word female, are ambiguous. We can speak of females in the biological sense. We, we can also speak of female electrical connectors. Right? That, uh, that, that's an example of polysemy. The word has two related meanings. It's not a kind of a coincidence that we call some electrical connectors female and other electrical connectors male because there's some vague resemblance to female and male genitalia. Um, and when... Um, when when we have ambiguity or polysemy, multiple meanings, um, there's still an answer to the question, what does this word mean? Uh, it's just that it has multiple answers. It either means this or it means in one sense, it means this, and in, uh, in another sense, it means this. But, but your most fundamental point, I think, was your, was your last point, um, which was... Um, yeah, sure. There are numerous categories out in nature, um, which we talk about, and numerous categories which we don't talk about. Numerous categories of things that we talk about. Numerous categories of things that um, that that we don't talk about. Um, the fact that uh, there is this category of things, as it might be, podcasters or pens. Uh, doesn't mean that we should um, uh, either have a word, a single word, which refers to all those things that are either podcasts or pens, and it doesn't mean that we should really care about this category, podcasters or pens, or make it some sort of requirement for um, getting into the party or something. Only only individuals who are either um, podcasters or pens can come to the party. Of course, that would be silly. No one wants to have the entry conditions to the party. Um be like be like that. So, sorry, just to go back now to um, to to male and female. You could you could accept all these points that I just made about male and female, and uh, and yet say, well, we should not organize society um, in a way that recognizes th this this distinction. There should not so, so, be spaces, especially for female people. Um, so, you should so, say so, that. So, so that's certainly yeah. true, and we'll we'll get to that. But I think there's a prior yeah. question as well, right? Which is that um, not only that there's certain uh, things like atoms yeah. or neutrons and so on in, in in the world, and and that's perhaps some kind of natural kind that 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 you know we can we can recognize. Um, so perhaps there's two natural kinds, which is you know organisms that produce large sex cells and yep. organisms that produce small sex cells. The question, though, is why is that the definition of male and female? Particularly because, as I understand it, there could be some circumstances in which an organism that produces large sex cells that therefore or ordinarily would be an egg-producing biological female 
will present, and this is the point made by those who focus on intersex conditions, in a way that uh, in very important ways appear to be male, for example, by having a penis or by having uh, anatomical features that look uh, to us more narrowly male. Why is it that sort of the question of uh, whether we are large XL producing or small XL producing creatures should be taken to be definitive of our understanding of sex. It may be definitive of something. It may be some important distinction in the world. Why is it obviously the distinction we should use to define biological sex? Well, it's not right. I mean, it's not perhaps completely obvious, but it's if you look at the wide range of males and females across the animal and plant kingdoms, it's the, it's the only account that makes any sense. If, if you've got some other account, uh, then let's hear it. Certainly an account in terms of um, appearance, broadly speaking, or primary or secondary sex characteristics, or you know, having, a, um, having a beard or having a penis or whatever, that is not absolutely not going to work. Um, an asparagus plant um, is, uh, I mean, asparagus plants come in male and female varieties, and a male asparagus plant is just as much a male as you are. Right. So unless you want to throw, throw that out and say, no, the biologists are actually confused, and uh, there, is no, um, there is no sex, that I, Yasha Mank, and the asparagus plant share, then um, being male just can't amount to these superficial features. And of course, biologists themselves recognize that we don't have to get into intersex conditions, which I think is a te te terrible term, very extremely misleading term anyway. Uh, biologists re recognize um, that... Um, uh, some some males, for example, uh, appear just as females, and some females appear just as males. So, for example, uh, the female hyena has um, uh, has a fake penis, uh, clitoris, which is uh, through which it gives birth, which is which looks just like a um, a penis, and also uh, a fake scrotum. And the female hyena is also very aggressive. So in a way, the female hyena is more male than the male hyena, but the biologists are not confused and think that the females are really the males. They know perfectly well what's going on. These are females that, in certain respects, behave and look just like males. So um, so let's take that point for a moment. Um, uh, I'm going to try and sympathetically excavate the point about uh, intersex conditions, or if you don't like the term intersex conditions, yeah, sure. about uh, you know, human beings who are not born uh, into uh, a category in which the primary sex characteristics or the secondary sex characteristics very easily fit into a binary distinction. Um, sure, yeah, sure. Uh, because I think the the the... The point here, to which I have some amount of sympathy, is to say, look, um, you know, in a in a in a in a simple, neat way of looking at the world, there's biological men and there's biological women, and biological men come with all of these kinds of things that are both uh, uh, biologically and socially important, right? They have a penis, they have uh, testosterone, they have all kinds of other things, right? And biological females come with different kind of characteristics, right? They have a vagina, they have breasts, they, you know, have estrogen uh, in higher quantities. And so, um, you know, and therefore, a natural way of organizing society is around these two categories. And this is just something that flows in a pretty straightforward way from the biology, right? And then there's people who respond to that by saying, well, okay, but there are these people, uh, not only, and we'll get to that, who don't feel like they want to conform with the expectations of it, biological sex, but there's people who actually, in a straightforward way, don't fit into one of those two categories in a straightforward way. Perhaps it's clear whether they're either large egg producing or small egg producing, but they may have uh, genitalia that uh, uh, bear some resemblance both to a penis and to a vagina, or they may have neither, or they may have, uh, you know, when you look at chromosomes, 
uh, not either two X chromosomes, uh, which typically women have, or one X and one Y chromosome, which typically men have, sure. but they might have XXY chromosomes, so XXXY chromosomes and so sure. on. Um, and so therefore, um, uh, you know, the seemingly simple concept of biology that explains the world to us doesn't explain, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't license the simple distinction into two categories for social and political purposes in the kind of way that we might afford. This, I take it, as the argument made by people um, who focus on this set of conditions. Um, why is it that we shouldn't buy that argument? Why is it that you're skeptical of uh, that complicating the biological picture in the way that uh, people who make this argument believe it does? Well, um, so for a start, I, I, I think what what you said goes beyond so-called intersex conditions, which are I, the reason why I think that term is confusing is because I think that the vast majority of intersex conditions are not conditions where the person in question uh, falls outside the categories male or or, or female. Um, I mean, one, one of the most common intersex conditions is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, where... Uh, a female fetus gets a, a, a higher than usual dose of androgens in the womb, and this um, can masculinize the genitalia to uh, to varying degrees. The literature on congenital adrenal hy hyperplasia um, is perfectly clear. These are just straightforwardly females. Maybe they're females with somewhat larger than usual um, clitorises, but... Uh, but that's that's it. Um, now, of course, you could. Um, oh, sorry, let me just give you another example. You you mentioned um, uh, that there are people with uh, XXY sex chromosomes. This is, if I'm remembering correctly, this is Klinefelter syndrome. Um, and if you have Klinefelter syndrome, uh, I mean, there are various health complications that go along with having Klinefelter syndrome. But essentially, you're just a um, a, a slightly unusual male. You, I mean, you look exactly like a male, but um, uh, with a few health complications to match. Now, of course, y you could um, argue that for some of these uh, conditions, um, we should make some special social dispensation, and you know, maybe we should have some third restroom for uh, people with certain intersex conditions, or we should have some extra option on forms, you know, when you have to tick, well, are you male or female, and there should be some third one. Intersex, actually, some this is often, uh, this is often the case these days. Um, uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, all that's fine. Um, uh, I think you're talking about an extremely small number of people um and f for the most part i mean the reason why the intersex conditions are sort of largely in l largely invisible people with them just ha happily slot into into one into one category or the other and don't feel the need to have some some third category although interestingly i mean this is related to what you call the identity the identity synthesis now being intersex is an identity category. It's a kind of political category. And uh, indeed on the Progress Pride flag, or one iteration of it, there's a circle um, to, to represent the, the intersex cons constituency. And there's an I in the LGBTQIA++ uh, alphabet list. So uh, there's certainly, a, it's a, certainly there has come to be um, a political um, connotation to this uh, to this to this category, which itself, just from a sort of medical point of view, is extremely extremely disunified. Um, because there's just a great heterogeneity of conditions under the that's label right. yes, of, exactly. of yeah, they should really be called. I mean, the official name is disorders of disorders of sex development. Mm. Um, what about some of, uh, yeah? But what about a different res response, which is um, uh, that sort of going back to 
what philosophers call the sorority paradox, right? So, um, uh, you know, some people have a full head of hair, some people are bald. Uh, you know, we are, I think, both in the condition of being somewhere in between. <laughs> right. We have some amount of hair. I think I'm cl- depending closer on- to bald than you are, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know, but it looks like perhaps you, you shaved more closely more recently. But um, now, uh, uh, so there will be many people who, where it's hard to determine whether they're bored or not. It's a hard, it's a hard case. It's That's somewhere right. in between, and it depends a little bit on your uh, uh, proclivities and inclinations, whether you say somebody who has a little bit of hair loss is bored or somebody who's pretty much has no hair, but they have a few hairs, perhaps they're not bored, right? We can have those arguments. But that, of course, doesn't mean that the categories of being bald or having a full head of hair are incoherent. Uh, no, that's coherent right. That's, categories yes, that that's explain very the important, important element of yes. the world, yes. um, even if some people don't easily fit yes. into them. So I've always wondered whether that is a, res- a, a way to accommodate the intersex point, which I think does have some amount of real force, but to show why that shouldn't make us throw out the biological categories of male and female. Oh, right. Yes, excellent. Um, so, uh, right. So almost every, all, almost everything is vague in in the in the bald sense. Um, that includes the category podcaster. You can have a sorority series for podcasters. You can have a sorority series for books. A sorority series for almost anything you want. Where. The guy in the middle, well, is he a podcaster or not? You want to say, well, he's not definitely a podcaster, but he's not definitely not a podcaster. Okay, and the very same thing goes for male and female as well. So the easiest case is just to think of an animal that actually changes sex in its lifetime. So take the fabled clownfish. They're all born male and under some conditions. Uh, some, um, a male can change, literally change sex from male to female. And this is a this involves um, uh, the uh, the gonads that produce the small sex cells degenerating, and the ovaries that uh, produce the large sex cells growing. Now, there there will um, th- this transition t- from male to female takes time, and there will be a point uh, at which it you want to say, well, it's not clear what sex the animal is now it's not it's not definitely male it's not definitely not male it's not definitely female it's not definitely not female so um uh i totally grant the point the categories male and female are uh are vague just as the category bald is vague however i don't think that uh, most of these so-called intersex conditions are conditions um, where it's uh, vague or unclear or indeterminate what sex the person is. So the, the, if you take uh, Kleinfelter syndrome, he, these people are un- unquestionably male. There's no, there's like, there's no literature which um, suggests that they aren't male. Uh, similarly with, with uh, congenital uh, adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, these these people are just clearly these sorry XX people with uh, congenital adrenal, adrenal hyperplasia. I, just, I, I should say these people are clearly female. They're clearly female, but they're somewhat masculinized females. There's like there's nothing. There should be nothing odd about the idea of a of a masculinized female. So um, we've discussed the concept of biological sex at, at good length now. Um, uh, 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 do you believe that the concept of gender is nevertheless useful? And broadly speaking, the way I understand it is to say that uh, there's biological sex. Um, and first of all, biological sex has historically come with a certain set of gendered expectations, which is to say that yes, um, depending on the society, there's been assumptions about this is how men act and this is how men should act and this is how women act and how women should act. Um, and even before you get to anything in the trans discussion, uh, there's a, con- a useful concept of gender to say, hey, hang on a second. Do, you, do we want to have those expectations? Is it true that there's uh, you know, something bad or unnatural about men crying? Perhaps if men were right. empowered to right. cry more often, that would make society better right. and happier. right? Is it true that women are really 
uh, made to sit in the kitchen and to be domestic. Right. Perhaps they actually have right. a lot to contribute to the workplace, right? Um, and so in the first instance, I take it that the concept of gender was used to critique the expectations that have historically come with a particular uh, belonging in a particular sex category. And that surely uh, sounds like a useful concept. Um, and, and then I guess... Right. Go ahead. No, no. Uh, and, and then I guess Sorry, in the second step... Finish the thought. Yeah, and then I guess in the second step, there's then the idea that, well, look, perhaps we do have some amount of useful uh, gender expectations uh, that correlate with biological sex. And here you can see how some of the trans discourse actually in an odd way can be a little bit traditionalist. Um, but uh, but if we're comfortable with that, if it's fine to have certain sets of expectations with what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman for how you should behave, then perhaps there's certain cat members of the category of biological males who prefer to live in society in keeping with the expectations that have historically been applied to women. Uh, and so uh, those may, in our parlance, be trans people. Right. They, them, yes, one way right. of understanding them is to say they're biological males who, for whatever reason, um, whether that's an innate, inborn thing or whether, that's, uh, whether it is not, um, uh, uh, believe that they would rather, uh, uh, you know, put on dresses and uh, speak in a more feminine way and whatever, you know, set of expectations our society happens to have about what it is to act as a biological female. Um, uh what do you make of that notion of gender and that justification for at least the thin notion of what it would be to be transgender and perhaps to respect that choice? All right. Okay. Okay. So just to start with gender. So uh, the the original sex gender distinction was made by the UCLA psychiatrist Robert Stoller in 1968, who wrote a famous book called Sex and, sex and Gender. And... Uh, in Stoller's hands, the notion of gender um, didn't play the role that you mentioned. It, it, it wasn't intended as part of some critique of gender norms or gender stereotypes or, or anything like that. Um, Stoller defined uh, gender as the amount of masculinity or femininity found in a person. And which was, if you think about it a bit, it's it's a pretty... It's a pretty terrible definition. It makes it's, very it's, hard it's to a use weird that word. way of defining yeah, yeah, concept. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But uh, it, um, it also it renders the question, "What gender are you?" somewhat um, nonsensical. But uh, Stoller's distinction was was picked up by, in particular, the feminist sociologist, British sociologist Anne Oakley, in the in the nineteen seventies, and. A lot of second wave feminists ran with that distinction, modifying it a lot along the way. And as you said, in 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 one version of, of, of the distinction, it's between sex on the one hand and uh, sex typed social roles or sex typed social expectations or sex typed norms on the other. So there's a distinction between male and female and then there's uh, sorry. There's the distinction between male and female on the one hand and uh, how males and females actually behave in a particular society, how they're expected to behave in a particular society, um, and so on. And this of, course, is, this, of course, is a genuine distinction. There really is a distinction between being a female on the one hand and um, uh, behaving in a certain culturally circumscribed way on the other, or being subject to a set of norms that apply only to female people. Um, now, I think, um, given that these are all useful distinctions, I mean, they're kind of obvious distinctions, if you think about them, it's not some like great discovery that there is such a distinction, you can find such distinctions back in the ancient philosophers, or, you know, Plato, for example, even though um, they, of course, they didn't use the word gender to mark that distinction. Now, I think that because gender has an, another very common meaning, actually, this goes back to your 
discussion of words and their, and their meanings. It has another common meaning, namely as a synonym for sex. It's just incredibly confusing to draw this distinction between sex and sex-typed norms or sex-typed social roles using the word gender just leads to no end of confusion. And gender also has other meanings as well within uh, within philosophy. So, so just to be and, amply clear about gender. this, what you're saying is that in some context, uh, a clinician may ask you, what's your gender? And mm -hmm. historically, at least until about 10 years ago, what we probably would have meant is, are you a biological male or are you a biological female? That's right. right. Um, and then in other That's contexts, right. we use the concept of gender to say, you know, Dolls historically have been, you know, to play with dolls historically has been a female gendered activity, right? And, and that really refers to something else. Sure, although, well, but the way you said it um, uh, didn't, doesn't really rely on some other, some other sense of, of gender. You can just put it much more straight, straightforwardly by saying, yes, play, playing, playing with dolls is a... Um, uh, we're talking about children, um, a female typical activity, um, and it's also expected of females that they that they play with dolls. Or maybe mm. you know, maybe back in the day, a girl who didn't play with dolls was uh, regarded as somewhat abnormal and um, uh, a transgressor, and this behaviour should be corrected because uh, that's what girls really ought to play with. They shouldn't play with Meccano sets or trucks, but dolls in, in, instead. You can say all that without even using the word gender. So, so one way of putting a point is that uh, in the word gender norms, you could actually just substitute it with sex norms. And yeah, that, it would be yeah, much the same that's thing. That's exactly right. Yeah, that, that is exactly right. I mean, I do think the word, I mean, the reason why the word gender came to mean sex is that it usefully disambiguates sex. So sex itself, just like numerous other words, is ambiguous, of course, between, between the intercourse sense and the male and female sense. And these days, of course, we, we, we talk about sexual intercourse um, all the time, 24-7. Um, so, and we do that using the word sex. So it's very useful to have another word uh, that means male or female, so we don't get we don't get confused. I think that that explains why gender became uh, a very popular replacement for sex in the male or in the male or female sense, and that is not going away. So, given that there is this constant pressure to use gender to mean male or to mean male or female, uh, introducing or stipulating another sense of gender to mean sex type social norms or masculinity and femininity or gender identity. That's another, um, sense of the word gender. It just, um, piles confusion upon confusion. The first thing you ought to ask when reading anything that's, uh, written about sex and gender, which just throws around the word gender is what on earth do the authors mean by the word gender? And it's often extremely unclear. In fact, so, in, the, in the work of Judith Butler, it is notoriously unclear what she means by gender. So, 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 what about though the kind of core sense of this that uh, uh, sort of some of so members of the trans movement would, would would point towards, which does seem to have obvious first order plausibility, right? Which is to say that yeah. uh, let's use the term sex norms, right? There are certain yeah. norms associated with your biological sex. Um, in the United States, even in 2024. Um, of course, yes. Uh, you know, and some people don't want to live in accordance with those sex norms, right? Even though they are biologically male, uh, That's right. they uh, uh, prefer to wear dresses and high heels and to, uh, 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 you know, have painted fingernails and uh, they prefer to speak in a more high-pitched voice and whatever else we would ordinarily associate with biological females in our culture. Um, and uh, that is a helpful distinction to make, right, between the biological sex and their preference as to um, how they want to lead lives. Um, and therefore, uh, to the extent possible, and we can go on to the debate about when that is possible and when perhaps it is not possible, when there's world trade-offs involved, we should treat them uh, with respect um, and allow them to do that, right? If they prefer 
to uh, wear dresses and to speak in a high-pitched voice and um, to uh, live lives as though they were biological women um, in a liberal society in which yes, uh, we yes. believe that people are self-determining um, and in which we hold something like the harm principle, um, we should say, well, why on earth not? Um, you do you, right? Um, so, 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 yeah, sort of, that far, do you do, do you agree or or, or oh do you no have I no I completely no I completely oh no I I completely agree. Um, of course, you mentioned Mill's harm principle, which is like extremely relevant because of course there are some some tricky cases in in uh, involving males uh, where the harm principle does seem relevant, but um, perhaps. Uh, uh, another dis distinction w would be useful of course some it, let's just th think about uh, about children for the moment forget uh, forget adults of course some um male children for whatever reason are if you like naturally very feminine and uh this is uh highly correlated with growing up to be a gay man and of course, you can be um, a very feminine, fingernail painting, um, high pitched um, male who is perfectly happy being a male and identifies as a man and just grows up to be this very feminine man. Uh, so there's a distinction between the very feminine man and. Um, a natal male who has uh, suffers extreme distress, gender dysphoria, uh, <coughs> at his sexed body, and at some point transitions, perhaps with the the help of surgery uh, or hormones, to live as a woman. Um, so these are two. Um, uh, uh, two very different outcomes for the um for a young male child who's very feminine um from uh from the get go and yeah with with respect to the the issue of whether this should be allowed or tolerated or respected or whatever yeah i'm completely on uh completely on board with that um as is i think um everyone or, or practically everyone, apart from certain reactionary people who think that gender transition should be banned across the board. Of course, the the really difficult hot button issues concern uh, the treatment of gender dysphoric youth. Whether, for example, they should be given uh, given puberty blockers. This was a a huge issue in. Uh, in the UK, which ultimately led to the um, uh, to the ending of um, the gender identity development service in 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 the UK, it was closed down um, partly due to various scandals involving uh, involving puberty blockers. So that's one uh, that's one issue, and then of course another issue is now turning to adults. Uh, whether you allow um, natal males who've gone through a male puberty but who live as women to compete in the female sporting category, for example, or you allow them to uh, go into uh, rape crisis centers just like any other, just like any natal female. Uh, uh, these are, are not... Well, uh, trivial issues that I, I don't think they can be, you know, brushed aside. There are uh, there are serious serious questions here. So, um. so let's start with the first set of these yeah. questions, perhaps. So, um, uh, I, you know, I suppose I see two complications here. One is that um, what we want is a society in which people are empowered to make life choices that are going to serve them well and make them happy and have a worthwhile life. And certainly um, overcoming uh, a constraining binary uh, gender, or if you prefer sex norms, 
which say that if you're born into this category, you must act this way. And if not, there's something defective about you and we're going to socially shame you uh, is uh, a, a terrible and very violent thing that we want to overcome. Of course, the question is how best to overcome that. And you might think um, the best way to overcome that is either allowing people to transition to live in accordance with the sex norms that don't correspond to their biological sex. Or you might say it is allowing people to present however they wish on a much broader range of forms of expression. And to some extent, and I think this is one concern um, uh, that you hear from some gay men and some lesbian women, uh, uh, this sort of transgender, uh, the particular form of a transgender movement has taken can cut against that. So that you're telling that young effeminate boy that not that it is fine to be a boy and be effeminate. Uh, there have uh, always been men who are more effeminate, and that's one possible way of being a man. But rather, if you're effeminate, if you prefer to play with dolls, then you must truly be a girl or a woman, and you must transition. Um, that's right. And uh, that's right. So, so that's one kind of concern. I guess the answer to that seems relatively straightforward, which is that uh, you know people should be able to make either choice, but we shouldn't correct. Uh, in the direction of then pressuring those effeminate boys to believe that they must truly be girls, when perhaps in some cases that may not be the case. Right. Um, the second set of complications, as you uh, pointed out, is uh, about biological uh, transition, uh, in particular in, in younger people. Um, so perhaps you can help us puzzle through that a little bit. What was the concern with the Travistock Clinic in England, run by the National Health Service, that got it uh, uh, closed down. Um, why is it that uh, some people who don't see themselves as reactionaries um, have uh, genuine concerns about uh, the way in which uh, uh, younger children or teenagers are giving puberty blockers or go through uh, transitions in the United States today? Right. So th there's a great book about the closure of the Tavistock Clinic and the events leading up to it by the journalist Hannah Barnes called called Time to Think, which I, which I thoroughly recommend. And th the um, I'm probably not going to get all the details exactly right, but um, some years ago in in, in the UK, um, I can't remember the exact year, uh, a case for judicial review was brought by um, a woman called Kira Bell, who was treated, I guess, by the Tavistock, uh, given, given um, testosterone. Uh, she had uh, a double mastectomy, and then she... Uh, decided that all all this was a uh, was a big mistake. She um, she wasn't transgender at all, or she shouldn't have been transitioned. Um, and that I think opened the uh, the floodgates somewhat, and the Tavistock's practices began to be more carefully scrutinised. And they had adopted the um, the so called Dutch protocol for treating. Um, juveniles with with gender dysphoria which was started to be developed in in the 90s and involved giving um so-called puberty blockers um very early in uh, puberty uh, around Tanner stage two um which halt um uh halt puberty and the original thought was that these uh, these drugs would function as a pause button. They would allow, in the title of Hannah Barnes' book, Time to Think. Right, hence the book is called Time to Think, yeah, I was right, going to right. say. Yeah. Um, but, but then it turned out, perhaps not surprisingly in, 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 in retrospect, that um, puberty blockers seemed to uh, be a, fa a fast forward button rather than a pause button and something like 95 percent of children put on puberty blockers i think these are the tavistock's own figures went on to take cross-sex hormones and to uh and to medically transition 
and so that was so that's one issue and then um another issue is just the the health impacts of of puberty blockers themselves and whether they um uh whether they actually help with um kids mental health uh there's really not very much evidence that they're particularly effective in that um in that regard and of course the, the this is an extremely serious issue because um this and this is just a general point it has nothing to do with the transgender issues specifically um all else equal, you want to avoid contact with the healthcare system uh, as much as possible. Especially, you, you don't want to go anywhere near um, a surgeon if you can possibly help it. So, um, again, this has got nothing to do in, in particular with 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 trans issues. But if all else is e if all else is equal. Um, you can choose the path of not having surgery and hormones, which have like enormous um, health health complications. Uh, then, then that's what you should do. So the 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 first line of treatment should really be to encourage people to um, to be comfortable living in their own sex bodies, rather than giving them puberty blockers, which just seems to speed up um, uh, the process of medical transition, in which case you end up as a, as a, lifelong, as a lifelong medical patient. Of course, if, if the first line of treatment doesn't work and the dysphoria persists into adulthood and you find you just can't live in your natal sex, then sure, go ahead and, uh, and transition. But... It, it 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 does seem to be remarkably irresponsible in in my view to um uh to to treat medical transitioning for uh uh for children as um, just some regular piece of medical care with 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 clear benefits um whereas it, it's really very um experimental and the evidence base for it is uh severely lacking so so or, or, there was or, or, a so, or, or to put yeah. it uh, to put it even uh, perhaps in a milder way but 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 which perhaps would be the way but i would put it um you know in any medical treatment you want to understand the trade-offs right i mean you take aspirin yes of course yes and of course. you have the indication of aspirin what it is that aspirin allows you to do and you have a long list of possible side effects of aspirin and you are supposed to weigh those two against each other and of course sometimes it makes sense to pop aspirin but uh you should think about the trade-off before you do i think one of the things that i found striking in the debate about this is the unwillingness to acknowledge that there's a difficult trade-off here. And on the one hand, I uh, uh, agree that by all accounts, there are people who suffer from terrible gender dysphoria, who suffer from uh, being in uh, the body uh, they are born into, um, who feel that this somehow um, is uh, unbearable, um, and that at least in some cases, that seems to lift... Um, after they uh, uh, transition um, uh, with surgery and other things. And so that's the prima facie case for allowing people to undergo those treatments in general and perhaps even at a young age. Now, of course, there's uh, the arguments on the other side, the, the trade-off that you have to look at as well, which includes things like the fact that many of these people become infertile um, and that this is a very difficult thing to make decisions about when you're 15 or 16. Um, I certainly, I think, at that age would afford either of my children um uh, but but uh, uh you know that is the sort of thing that one might change uh, one's mind about over the course of ad adulthood um uh you know secondly that there seem to be some serious concerns for example about the potential loss of bone density because it is when going through puberty right. that uh, you have a great increase in bone density and so on and so there's just some questions about what the health of some of these people are going to be when they're 70 or 80 years old whether they're going to be significantly uh, weakened by this much more um, uh, subject to, um, you know, dangerous uh, injuries like uh, uh, having 
the, you know, breaking the hips and, and other kinds of things, right? And then third, of course, there are the cases like Kira Bell, a story we actually published in Persuasion in her voice. It was oh, the right, first place right, that's right. She, I remember uh, published that now, yes. Um, who come to regret uh, transitioning. And there is a very heated, very complicated debate about uh, how high the rates of detransition are. Um, but again, what concerns me is a climate in which instead of wanting to understand this, uh, it is rendered taboo. And what I don't understand about this, or what, what I have to say that I really um, become very saddened, is that all of this is treated as in some way being anti-trans. But um, you know, if you're concerned about whether people undergoing these medical treatments might come to regret not being able to have children, if you worry about what the long-term health is going to be at the age of 80 or 70 or 60, if you worry that some of them may come to regret that intervention, that is, in fact, a concern for those specific individuals. So the idea that this somehow is, um, as is often implied in the overblown rhetoric, uh, you know, connected with a, with a desire that these people not exist or that the interest not be counted or anything like that is, I think, um, uh, just, just fundamentally wrong, but maybe true of certain people in this debate, but it's certainly not true of most of the people who have these concerns, including clinicians who have worked with these populations for a very long time who were attracted to this field because they had a lot of empathy for them, but who came to worry that they perhaps in certain cases are doing more harm than they're doing good. Yes, yes, I think that's exactly right. And yeah, you, you raised a very important point about uh, about fertility and consent, which I, which I forgot uh, to mention. Um, I mean, sometimes you get the, the impression from the more overheated rhetoric that um, skeptics about youth gender medicine are um, uh, rather like skeptics about vaccines. Um, you know, their 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 positions are just as implausible as someone who, let's say, was very skeptical about the about the measles vaccine, and in, in I think which was introduced in in 1963. So measles, before the vaccine came along, killed thousands and thousands of children uh, every year. And I think it was that disease was actually eliminated in the U.S. in 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 2000. And um, sometimes, I mean, the, 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 there's a phrase that often gets flung around, namely that um, gender affirming care is life saving treatment. And so the opponents are are portrayed as um, just as people who. Uh, in fact, skeptical of the measles vaccine. Here is this treatment which saves many, many lives a year, and for some perverse reason, you bigots are are against it. But this is there's no evidence whatsoever that this treatment is is uh, is life saving. It may well be beneficial in 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 some cases, but obviously before the puberty uh, uh, blocker Dutch protocol came along, there are no. There's no, there's no evidence that hundreds or thousands of children were committing suicide or dying prematurely through lack of um, gender affirming treatment. So yeah, you're absolutely right that this is uh, it's a, a, a complicated matter of trade offs, complicated uh, ethical issues about uh, about consent. It's exactly the sort of topic that philosophers should be interested in. So one would have expected a uh, lively debate on these ethical issues in in the philosophy journals. But um, there, at, at least to date, there is there is no such there is no such debate because of the generally intolerant attitude that prevails in philosophy at the moment uh, towards people with um heterodox if you like views on on sex and gender on a complete side note um i have in fact had measles and i've had measles in the united states and i got it ah. through the vaccine um oh, really? which <laughs> okay. is um something that happens once in a hundred thousand cases because i believe the measles vaccine ah. is in fact a live virus um, yeah, yeah. you end up getting a less right. severe case of it 
But I had okay. it um, <laughs> because I took the MMR vaccine. I think I needed it to Excellent. enroll in my graduate program or something like that. My mother takes terrible records, so she didn't have a record of whether or not I'd had these vaccines as a kid for me to I prove see. to be able to enroll. And I walked, and I was the most tired I'd been in my life. I mean, so dragging myself from the library to home while I was this was coming on was, was really an experience. And I went to a doctor's office in Brooklyn of a older uh, uh, black lady who was, who, was, who was running the doctor's practice. And I walked in and she just pointed at me and laughed loudly. And, said, and she said, you got the measles. I haven't seen one of I those see. in 20 years. <laughs> right. um, so I uh, right. spent a couple of days uh, watching Mad Men and um, feeling like a biological bomb. And, um, and I, I was fine. Um, mm. But uh, uh, on this unlikely side note, um, I think there's one last topic that we haven't covered, which is the question of sports. Um, uh, how do we puzzle through this? Um, you know, on the one hand, we have established the general presumption that um, if people want to live in accordance with the norms of a particular kind of uh, gender, um, then they should be able to do that. And that means they'd rather play on the women's team than the men's team. In principle, there shouldn't be a problem. The Worry, of course, is that uh, people who have uh, gone through male puberty, who have gone through puberty as biological males with the levels of testosterone that this involves, uh, would end up having a competitive advantage over uh, biological women in many, perhaps in, in most, in virtually all sports. Um, so right. um, how do we uh, resolve this tension or this trade-off? Okay, that that is an excellent question. Maybe I should say well, just one thing. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, you already alluded to, to it with um, male puberty. This has got nothing to do with some anti-transgender prejudice, as at the case of trans men, that is natal females who take testosterone and transition to live as men, uh, shows. They, they have not gone through male puberty. They uh, uh, um, pose no competitive threat to natal males competing in athletic categories. So there should be no issue, and indeed, indeed there is no issue, about whether they can play on the men's team. Go right ahead. Um, so if the, if, uh, the position were symmetrical for trans women, there would be absolutely no issue. But it isn't symmetrical because male puberty does give you, through testosterone, as you said, um, a considerable athletic advantage. Now, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, what about Michael Phelps? He is... Uh, an exceptional male in certain respects, you know, we don't ban him from uh, from swimming just because, I don't know, he has exceptionally low levels of lactic acid or um, large feet or something like or something like that. Um, and that's true. But uh, Michael Phelps is a developmentally sort of ordinary, ordinary male, there's nothing um, uh, qualitatively different um, about him compared to uh, compared to other males, whereas the male and female uh, body are really quite different. And I think, in a way, the um, uh, the position of transgender women in uh, female sports is very much like that. Uh, they are they they really are quite different. I mean, the swimmer. Um, the University of Penn swimmer Leah Thomas is uh, a, um, an example. They really are quite different from um, from females. Um, even like setting aside abstract issues about fairness or whatever, just as a practical matter, given that there are so few of these people and given that they make, as it were, a huge splash when they do win and people get really annoyed and... Um, lots of women uh, complain and say, gosh, you know, why can't we just have a category for for females? Why can't we just celebrate the female body? Given all that, I, I think it's like perfectly reasonable to, um, to exclude 
um, natal males who've gone through male puberty from from the female category. There's an easy fix, which is just to have just turn the male category into or the the category for men into an open category um and then there's no there should be no um uh presumption that if you enter the open category you live life as a man it's perfectly consistent with entering the the open category that you live life as a uh as a woman and so your suggestion um, is that there would be one category that is the general open category in which are both are biological females, biological males, and biological yeah. males who have transitioned to female are open to compete. Sure. Um, and yeah, then there's the... a second category, which would be reserved for biological females. Yeah, the female-bodied um, category. Yes, that's right. I, that, I see. that seems to be the most straightforward the... way of... Uh, I mean, of course, one. And, you know, you can understand why someone who lives life as a woman would not want to compete in the category that is explicitly labelled for men. Right, that's reasonable, yes. Um, even though this person may be literally, and indeed on, in, on my view is literally a man, nonetheless you could see how uh, this is a little bit jarring, um, but you can relabel the category an open one and uh, allow anyone in. Um, I, one thing that I find interesting in this debate, well, two points. I mean, first of all, I think... To me, it's just looking through this whole set of complicated questions as trade-offs just makes it so much easier, right? So uh, for me, there's a very clear distinction between highly competitive sports and the Sunday League, right? And there's a distinction yeah, sure. of, for obvious yeah. biological reasons between young kids and kids who've undergone puberty, right? That's talking right. about eight or 10 year olds. Um, you know, if a boy wants to be on the girls' team, let the boy be on the girls' team because he hasn't undergone puberty, he probably doesn't have a particular advantage anyway. When you're talking about a non-competitive league, right, where people's skill levels are so all over the place that um, the fact of having undergone male puberty makes less of a difference because nobody is at the top end of what uh, athletes can achieve in any case, uh, sure, let it be open. Um, perhaps when it's uh, a contact sport like rugby or something like that, where there's higher danger of injuries and so on, you might apply different rules. But these are all situations in which you can actually have relatively pragmatic trade-offs that try to be respectful to the different sets of interests at hand. The reason why I think uh, some uh, smart and well-intentioned people are reluctant to see the problem with uh, a competition at the highest levels is actually a background belief. It has nothing to do with trans people, but that is, I think, quite widespread in our society. And that is the denial of significant athletic differences between men and women. I just think that people are not nearly as aware as they might be of uh, the difference in top performance between different categories. So, for example, in uh, uh, you know track and field and sprint, uh, you know the strongest high schoolers in the United States are roughly at the level of the best women in the world. Um, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, tennis, we've seen um, in informal matches, the, you know, most distinguished women lose to the 300 seed, the 400 seed on the men's tour. Um, but I think because there's been rightfully an emphasis on gender equality um, and a reluctance to be explicit about this, people then go on to say, well, how much of a problem could this possibly pose? Because we really don't understand to what extent um, uh, sort of allowing people who've undergone male puberty to compete in the women's category would quickly allow uh, those people to dominate those categories. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, this is a uh, this is a hangover, I think, from a lot of second wave feminism, which tended to seriously downplay the differences between males and females, I mean, particularly at the psychological level, but also at the purely purely physiological level. I mean, Anne Fausto Sterling once suggested that the gap in male and female athletic performance could be closed by, um, uh, by proper nutrition. Her idea was that, well, you know, maybe girls aren't really eating enough. And so um, if we if we fed them properly, then they'd then they'd catch up uh, to boys. All this this is 
this is just totally wrong. And actually, what what happens is is completely the reverse. That under conditions of proper nutrition, the gap, the physical gap between males and females, gets wider. It doesn't get narrower. Um, and what you said about trade offs is, I think, exactly right. So you can find many arguments which are not trade-off arguments at all. So people say things like, well, look, if transgender women are literally women, then of course they uh, should compete in the women's category. It is, after all, the women's category. Uh, and then you can find people on the other side saying, well, transgender women are not literally women. Therefore, of course, they should not compete in the women's category. So that's not just some, that's not a trade. We're not trading anything off. This is just seems, seems to be a sort of straightforward syllogism, but it's wrong in, in, in both cases. So the whole thing should be framed as one of, one of trade offs, as you, as you said. So finally, let me just understand one thing, which is a, um, uh, you have an interesting philosophical contribution to make. Um, but much of a conversation ended up feeling less philosophical, or at least I wasn't always able to see sort of where the line goes from the philosophical insights to these takeaways. So to what extent do these questions actually hinge on philosophy? And to what extent do they hinge on, uh, you know, simply taking into account the interests of different people in a reasonable way and having a realistic view of how social institutions work? And then secondly, I have to say that after all of this conversation, I'm a little bit baffled about what is so controversial about this book. So, um, you know, why is it and what is it <laughs> really in this exciting. conversation that is supposed to have been uh, so unserious or so concerning? Right. OK. Yeah, that, that's. Uh, uh, yes, very good. So um, it, just on the question of how much of this is philosophy and how much isn't, I mean, I think these um questions of disciplinary boundaries are generally quite boring you know what is philosophy and what isn't um is this question really philosophy or not that is not typically a very interesting question however there there are some uh questions which seem to be recognizably philosophical which i do treat in the book for example what is a woman after all this you know what is X question goes back to Plato, what is justice, what is truth, what is knowledge, and so on. As far as I know, Plato or Socrates never asked, what is a woman? Um, but it does seem to be, um, uh, insofar as you have an intuitive handle on what a philosophical question is, that seems to be a philosophical question. But you're right that um, a lot of the book, I don't think really counts as uh, as philosophy, although I think the Perhaps a better way of thinking of it is. But, but is I guess, this. I guess, let me, the, let me be frank, the tools of yeah, yeah. Well, let sorry, me no. reframe the question because I'm less interested in sort of the disciplinary boundary policing, right? I'm not a yeah. kind of uh, yeah. on a promotion committee in philosophy, which is deciding whether you know to give you a yeah. nicer office or something, right? Um, uh, but 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 rather, sort of a question is: to what extent does what we should do? about trans questions actually turn on these fundamental philosophical questions? And to what extent will we actually come up with better, more humane, more sensible approaches and solutions by ignoring some of those questions where somebody's going to say, trans women are just women, we must be treated exactly the same in all circumstances. And other people are going to say, no, we're not women, and therefore we should not accommodate them. And just say, how do we build a society in which we pe treat people fairly and respectfully and what does that mean if we want to take the competing interests and concerns of everybody into account? So is getting away from some of those philosophical questions yep. actually a better guide to what to do on this difficult issue? Yes. No, I think, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, in a way, perhaps that's one of the morals of the book. So even though we've talked about social and political uh, issues, um, including youth gender medicine and who should compete in what sporting category. That is not what the book is about by design. I, I wanted to decouple the social and political issues, questions about what we should do 
what policies we should adopt from the more descriptive um, factual questions. What is a woman? What is gender identity? Do we all have gender identities? What are the differences between human males and females? Um, there's even a chapter on uh, uh, on patriarchy and what explains the persistence of patriarchy throughout history. And then there's a, a chapter that we didn't actually touch on at the very end about I, uh, about identity and uh, and the true self. And there are all these questions um, which uh, are the answers to which are often taken to be highly relevant to the social and political issues. And I suppose one moral of the book is that uh, there's really no straight line from the answers to these questions to uh, to policy. So uh, there's no straight line in particular from answers to questions about what a woman is to um, policies about who should be allowed to compete in what sporting categories. But the... Um, uh, the more factual descriptive questions are I think just fascinating in themselves. Everyone is fascinated by these by these issues. And so um, they certainly deserve an entire they certainly deserve an entire book, but the book itself doesn't uh, pretend to settle the social and political political questions insofar as it bears on them, it's to uh, suggest that uh, there's, there's less of a connection between the answers to these factual questions and questions about policy than is often assumed. Alex Byrne, um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Pleasure. Thanks very much.